Well, for those of you that are visiting uh, with us today, we're so grateful and honored that you've taken this opportunity to come and to, to worship with us. Um, if you are visiting, we'd love to connect with you. And one of the ways we love to do that is for you to visit our welcome centers. There's one on each level in the foyer. And we have a little gift for you, a little connect card for you to fill out. There's also, uh, I believe, a QR code on the screen if you're tech savvy and you want to complete a card that way. But please make sure you stop by and leave with just a, a little gift from us to say thank you so much for, uh, for joining with us. I'm going to go through the announcements today. If you're a part of this church family, you know this is a weird look for me. But it's just one of those Sundays. Pastor Justin uh, and Pastor Spencer are away. Um, Jennifer was supposed to do the announcements today. She's not well today. Our daughter's not well today. Um, the internet's down. And Pastor Julia slept in. That's true. Can't lie in God's house. She's here now, though. This daylight savings, this, this one will kick you in the pants if you're not paying attention, that's for sure. Um, no excuse, though. Don't worry. We're going to charge her half of a vacation day for being late. It'll be fine. It'll all come out in the wash. But I am going to go through the announcements, but here's what we're all going to do. We're all going to take time today and this week to visit the website, rockchurch.ca, slash what's happening, so that you can know what's happening. So to know what's happening, where are you going to go? rockchurch.ca, slash what's happening. And we're all going to do our best to stay on the same page. But here's some things I do know. We do have our annual membership meeting on March 24th. That's coming up in just really two Sundays from now. And so we need all of our covenant members to, to come and to participate in that. This is a time for us to, you know, to understand what has transpired and taken place over the last year so that you can stay informed. But of course, we also need a quorum to be able to hold that meeting. And so March 24th at 6 p.m. I think that's true. We're going to have it at 6. Someone write that down. We're having it at 6. Also, uh, baptisms are coming up. Same day, March 24th. I'm excited for baptism, and I hope you are too. If you have not been baptized and you're a follower of Jesus, this is your Sunday. Get baptized as God's Word teaches us. And so contact the church office, please, so that we can know that you're going to participate and be a part of that. And join us next Sunday. So the baptism's on the 24th. But next Sunday, which is the 17th, we have a special baptism class following the service out in our prayer room, which is right here on the lower foyer, uh, just off the lower foyer. So come and be a part of that. Uh, we have Recovery Church next Sunday night. At, uh, service starts at 6, but pizza starts at 5. Come and participate. It's an opportunity for those that might be struggling in addiction or have come through by God's grace through an addiction into recovery to kind of just come and support one another and believe with one another and see God do what only God can do. So that is next Sunday, pizza at 5, service at 6. And now there's an alpha video. Let's check this out. We share things every day. Things that are meaningful to us, that entertain, inspire, or challenge us. We share moments, good or bad, big or small. Because what we share matters. We have the chance to share something incredible, the hope that has transformed our lives. And today, more than ever, people are searching for hope, for connection, for meaning. The life we've experienced in Jesus is available to our friends and neighbors, and it's easier to share than we might think. Over the next few weeks, we are running Alpha, an opportunity to share Jesus with friends, family, and colleagues in person or online. Each week, we'll connect with each other, watch a short video, and have time to discuss our thoughts and questions without needing to have all the answers. All it takes is a simple invitation. Share life, faith, hope, Jesus. Who will you invite? Our Alpha series begins on April 7th. That's beginning on a Sunday night. You're going to hear much more about this in the coming weeks because I firmly believe that God's going to do something amazing in the lives of so many people as we, as his church, take our responsibility seriously, reach out to those whom God will put in our path 
to invite to something like this, to invite, and I would add, to come with to this Alpha series that will begin on April 7th. You'll hear more about this, and I'm sure I'll reference it even today as I, I talk a little bit uh, about uh, evangelism. Well, before I get into today's message, I'd like to invite Pastor Bruce and Lisa Belair uh, to come down. Uh, Pastor Bruce has some thoughts that uh, he'd like to, to share with you. Uh, and uh, he and I were actually talking while we were uh, in Brazil, of all places. While we were with each other in Brazil, we had no other choice but to talk to each other constantly. <laughs> and so um, something came up that, uh, that he wanted to share with the church congregation, and uh, I'm going to let him do it. Let's welcome Pastor Bruce. If, if, you don't know, if you don't know Pastor Bruce and Lisa, Pastor Bruce was uh, a youth pastor here in this congregation for like 26 to 28 years. We, we called him back a few times to, uh, to help us out. And Lisa is our longest serving staff member who's now been here for 39 and a half years. There was a time when child labor wasn't as bad as it is right now, and so we got her very young and, and kept her, but Pastor Bruce and Lisa. Hey, yeah, yeah good, good morning, everyone. How are you? Yeah, boy, my heart is filled again with thanksgiving. I'll tell you, it's a great day to be alive. Amen? Oh, what, a, what an exciting day. I am Brazilian now. <laughs> Most affectionate, warm people I've ever met. Like, I never got hugged so much, and like, it was... A, Complete strangers. I'd walk into the mall and make friends with people and they'd hug me. It was amazing. Right. Anyway, um, what I want to talk to you about is um, uh, we want to take an offering up on the 24th of March to fix the house of the Lord. And I believe that um, uh, we can do this. Uh, that carpet is really tired and it needs to be replaced. And, um, and uh, really, uh, there's a lot of good things happening. And um, the mortgage is getting paid down, which is really good. That'll be paid off, I, I believe, very soon. And, um, and that, but we need to spend a little money and put new lights. Them lights are dingy. Um, you wouldn't want to get me in here. I'd fix everything, right? But uh, anyway, I, I, I've been going to the church for 48 years. I started going when I was a teenager I, in 1976. And I remember when we built this building, um, we put the roof on. Uh, it was Pastor Paul, myself, my brother Andrew, uh, John Ernst, who is a, a, like a, a legend, and Les Hibbs was our boss. He was a great man of God, and he was the superintendent, and, and we, we nailed every board on, and then Pastor Paul, you and myself, we, we stained that whole ceiling up there. And I was 21 years old then, you know, and uh, a lot of water's gone underneath the bridge, I can tell you, you know, but uh, my, most of my life was here. And, uh, and I'm, I'm thankful to the Lord. And so I want to challenge you to give in an offering, and we're just sowing seed this morning, in an offering on the 24th that we can take care of all these things and don't have to take any money anywhere else. And there's enough money here, trust me. Right? And I want to challenge all the young people. I'll tell you a couple of stories here um, before, before I'm done that will challenge young people, even when you're young and you got your first job, to give to the work of the Lord. It, you'll never go wrong. Um, when I was in Brazil, we were in a worship service, and I had new, because my wife, uh, you know, works on the board and, and, and knows things that I don't know, and uh, she told me that they were going to buy chairs for our church, and, I, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm in the worship service, and I leaned over to Pastor Chris, and I said, Pastor Chris, we can't put those chairs in our building without fixing our carpet. We just need to fix the carpet. We need to get rid of this ugly carpet and uh, fix the house of the Lord. And I just felt in my heart, and we're willing to give a good offering ourselves, Lisa and myself, to, and we want you to partner with us to fix the house of the Lord. And I wanna remind you, all through the Old Testament, when they fixed the house of the Lord, there was always a tremendous blessing that was released. Just read the book of Haggai. You know, when you, when, you, when you take care of God's house, God will take care of your house. You put God first, he'll put you first. It just, it just, it's just the way that God works. Uh, I'm, I have a verse in the Bible. It's, in, it's a really interesting verse. It's in Luke chapter 3. And it says, Now the people were in expectation about the, and reasoned in their hearts 
about John the Baptist. I read that and I thought to myself, the people's hearts were filled with expectation at the preaching of John. And I thought to myself, interesting verse, because for 400 years, there was no voice in Israel. For 400 years, there was no prophetic voice in Israel. It was like just religion. It was like going to the synagogue. It was just like rules and regulations and just following the rules. No, no, no fresh, vibrant thing. And then this fiery prophet of God comes on the scene. He has his own like um, clothing. He has his own diet. He's different than everybody else. And the people's hearts were filled with expectation. And one thing I found out about expectation, expectation is the soil in which miracles grow. Right? Because if, you don't, if your heart's not filled with expectation, you're always talking about what used to be. And this is a real, real challenge for older people. I'm 65 years old. I know I don't look it. My wife only looks 20. But, but, but I'm 65. I like, I'm supposed to be retired. I'm never going to retire. I hope I die with my boots on. That's my prayer. Right? But, 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 but I, I just want to tell you that, um, that uh, uh, I, 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 my heart is just filled, filled with expectation. And if what you're seeing in your rearview mirror is more exciting than what you're seeing in your windshield, you're in trouble. And older people often always think about what used to be. Now, I was running the youth group back in the 80s, and I'll tell you, you can never get the 80s back again. Everything worked. We had hundreds and hundreds of young people coming. But it's a different day now. I think it's more exciting now than it's ever going to be. I believe with all my heart, and I'm going to tell you this, that we are on the the, the verge of a major breakthrough of God in this church. I'm, I'm just telling you. And, I, and, and I'm not saying this is not hype. This is not hype at all. This is absolute truth. I come here and I look and I see all the nations of the world here. Last night I was invited for, in, Lisa and myself were invited for Indian dinner at, at Sunel, uh, Sunel and Motri and Sonny's uh, house, and they cooked Indian dinner for us. And I'm thinking, and these people love God. They've only been here a few months, and they come from India, and they love the Lord with all their heart, and all the Brazilians, and all the people from Nigeria, and all over Africa are here, and people from Mexico, and people from, like, everywhere are here. And I thought, this is more like heaven than ever. Because the Bible says every nation, kindred, tongue, and people are going to be there. So we're getting closer to heaven. You know, it's like, so this is a good thing. This is a good thing. And so, so my heart is filled with expectation. Um, uh, I, I want to just say, tell you this. Tithes and offerings. If you're not a tither, I'm just going to sow this seed. I paid my first tithe when I was 18 years old. I come from a, a church that didn't even talk about tithing. And I wasn't saved, I got saved 18 years old. My first tithe was $15. I made $150 a week, you know? And I put my $15 in the plate. And, uh, it, and since then, I don't know, not unless I died or forgot something, I have never missed paying my tithes in 48 years coming to the church. Never. And, and I, I've learned a principle from Pastor Ted and Paul Uke that I never was taught when I was going to church when I was younger about giving. And I've had so many miracles in my life about giving. And I want to challenge you. God will always ask you to give. Sometimes he'll speak to you a figure and you'll think, mm-mm, that's the devil. <laughs> right? No, he'll always challenge you to give because if you move, God will move. And I don't know when he'll move, but he'll move. And, and God does incredible things. And so I had... Um, a couple of things I, I just want to mention to you. I was uh, a young lad, 18 years old, and I had a motorcycle, and we raced motorcycles at the racetrack up in Shubenacadie, and, and I had a brand new Yamaha I just bought, and the Lord spoke to me, and he said, sell it and give the money to the church. We were buying a gospel tent, and I was only 18. If my father knew I had done this, he would have killed me, right? And I sold my motorcycle, and I gave the money to the church, 18 years old. I still owed money at the bank for the motorcycle. You know, and I and I gave I gave the money to the church, and it wasn't a few short while later, a couple years later, a man walked up to me and gave me the keys to a four-wheel drive truck, and I sold that truck and I went to Bible school in San Diego, California. (laughs) 
And, and, so, and so what, what I'm trying to tell you is this, that was a good seed sown. You know what I'm saying? Because Lisa is a star. I walk in her shadow. Like, it's, it's unbelievable. But anyway, uh, anyway uh, and the Lord blessed us. And then another time, I've had so many miracles, like financially. The Lord's blessed us so much. We've had over 250 people at our house uh, over the last summer in, in the air. And uh, uh, people come to our house swimming and, and stuff. And that's what we do. We don't own anything. I just got this revelation. I own nothing. Right. I'm just a steward. And we just take care of it for the kingdom of God because somebody else is going to get everything I got anyway when I die. Right. So I got a revelation. I'm, I'm sowing seed for eternity. Amen. My thoughts are fixed on heaven. Amen. And that's why you, your, your days ahead of you are better than the ones that you have now. And so tithes and offerings. So I, I give my tithes and, I, and, and, and offerings all, all the time. And one time we were over in Prince Edward Island. Our kids were young, probably about 25, 30 years ago. And the church in Summerside was buying a, a new building for their church. They were in a school at this time. And I was the special speaker th this particular morning where they were taking an offering up for their building. And uh, we had no money. Lisa will tell you, we were like broke. It was like in the fall, just before Christmas. And we had no money. Three kids, you know, like living from paycheck to paycheck, you know, nothing. And I had a line of credit. And I remember we were in the hotel room, and my kids were there, and I said, they were only young, and I said, I'm going to put $500 in the offering this morning and see what the Lord will do. And I showed it to my kids. I remember I showed it to them. And we, we couldn't afford it, but I thought, ah, we're so far deep into it, like, let's go for it, right? <laughs> so, so I put it in, and I'm at this church, and they don't talk about money at this church. When you go there and speak, they give you a couple of hundred bucks and they think they did you a favor, right? And, 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 uh, and so I preached. Pastor got up at the end of the service and he said, I believe that we should take an offering up for the Bel Airs this morning. I got 2,400 bucks. So now, they'll get a hold of this. Now I'm leaving the island, 1,900 to the good. I get home. I, I, we're home, I'm feeling good about this. We get home, the very next Sunday, I come to this church. I'm sitting over there. I was the youth pastor. And halfway through the service, my picture comes up on the, on the screen. Pastor Ted gets up and he says, we're going to honor Pastor Bruce today and bless him. And uh, I came up and made me embarrassed and everything. And they had a basket here. And the people from the congregation came up and just in envelopes. They didn't even get uh, receipts for their giving. And they came up and they put envelopes in, in, a, in a little basket there. I went home and counted the money, 13, almost $14,000. So now I'm 15000 to the good. <laughs> Brother Josiah, this was a good Christmas. You know? The point is, I've had so many miracles like this. I could tell you more and more and more. But I'm, I'm just telling you that young people, give. Listen, if you're not a tither, like, it's a relationship. It's not church tax. It's, it's, it's a relationship with God Almighty. It, it, in the days that we live, like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I would give to the kingdom of God. His interest rates are way better up in heaven. He's going to give you a better return than what you're going to get here. You know, like, I'm, not, I'm telling you, this is, it, you're like, it, it's just awesome. And so, and another thing, too, before Lisa says a few words, I want to tell you this, that giving... Like, I shingled a roof yesterday for a really good friend of mine, a grad's roof. Brother Bruce is not a spring chicken anymore. I had to go home and soak in the tub. I'm, I'm, I'm sore all over, Amanda. Like, I'm telling you. Like, I, like, but anyway, I did it. And, and, and I get paid for doing it. And then when I put my offering in, money is one of the greatest acts of worship you can do on a Sunday. Because I'll tell you why. We sing a few songs. People think that's worship. And it is. Slow songs are worship, fast songs are praise. No, no, your whole life is worship. And so when you work, whatever job you do, and you work hard, and you put in those hours, and you put that money in the offering plate, when you put that money in the offering plate, that is the greatest act of worship. It's not just 10 minutes of singing or 20 minutes of singing. It represents hours and hours of your life. And you put that in the plate. Right? And you put it in the plate because you're, 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 you're financing and you're putting your money into fixing the house of God. And the house of God needs to be fixed. Amen? 
All right, he said, I'll just say a few words and that will be it because I'm a woman of few words. All I'm going to say is I have, I can say what he has said my whole life. Once I understood tithing, I have always tithed. I have never been without. I have never had tons, but that doesn't matter. I've always had what I needed. And so what I'm going to encourage you is what we are, when we take the offering two weeks from today, it's an offering. It's not your tithe. Your tithe goes to general work, keeping the, the house of the Lord running. But this offering is going to be above and beyond your normal tithe. Saying that, remember, and this is what I have to remind myself all the time, nothing we have is ours. The house that we live in is not ours. Like Bruce said, we're stewarding it. Our vehicles are not ours. The money in our bank account, whether it be a lot or a little, is not ours. It belongs to the Lord. If you're a Christian, if you are a believer and, and God is your source, everything you have belongs to him anyway. So we're just giving back a portion of what he has blessed us with. It's not ours. So keep that in mind. Is, and uh, when you give, you're not giving to the church. You're giving to God. And God will reward you abundantly. He has done that for many of you in this church could say that. Those of you who have been here years, I know you. You could say that. God has been your, your provider, so he will provide. So anyway, we just encourage you to prayerfully consider what you could give, whether it be a small portion or a large portion. It doesn't matter the amount as much as it matters your heart. Where is your heart? Where is your heart? Okay? So bless you. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Bruce and Lisa. That's awesome. So we'll, we'll do that on the, the 24th. Um, Apologies. Uh, there are many people in our congregation who, as Pastor Bruce and Lisa said, who can uh, tell similar stories, but you don't have to be serving Jesus a long time to experience those stories. Pastor Bruce was very young um, and just decided to take God at his word. Oh, how much better would we be if we really believed what God says is true? It would change everything. Change everything. And so those stories are still unfolding. I won't share anyone else's story today, but I got a call this week of just this unbelievable, other than if you know God, you know it's believable, a miracle, financial miracle in someone's life. And I'll say this to you. We as the followers of Christ don't give so that we can get. We give because we've already received so much, so much from our Heavenly Father. He saved us. How many saved people in the room today? Yeah, if not, you can be today. You can confess Jesus as Lord, and you can be saved today from your sins, saved from eternal judgment being made apart from God for all of eternity. You can be with him in that heavenly place, but as amazing as that is, you can experience heaven on earth as you're in relationship with him. And so um, I'm gonna talk today as a, an extension of um, a topic we started last week about the spiritual discipline of evangelism. Evangelism meaning sharing the gospel with people. And so if you could please turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew. We'll be starting there today. Matthew, if you've been going through our um, reading plan with us, you know that we're in the book of Matthew. And if you've been reading even one chapter a week. This coming week, you will come upon Matthew chapter 9, and that's where we are today. Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 35. Matthew 9, beginning in verse 35, says this. Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogue, synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. He healed every kind of disease and illness. When, the, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion. Say compassion. Compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like a shepherd. I'm sorry, like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest, asking him to send more workers into his fields. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we go to your holy word today, 
We pray that you would give us the eyes to see, the ears to hear, the mind to understand, and the heart to receive everything that you would say to us. We choose in this moment, as we have declared in weeks past, that we will receive your word with careful attention today, that we will fix our eyes upon your holy word, listening carefully to what you have to say, that we will let your truth occupy and control our hearts so that we can experience all that you have promised, life to our souls and health and strength to our minds and bodies. We declare this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. In this portion of scripture in Matthew chapter 9, the harvest that Jesus is speaking of is a harvest of souls. And for this to take place, Jesus is saying there needs to be active participation. Say active participation. Now, how many people in this room did not actively participate in even saying active participation? Let's try one more time. Active participation. There you go. God is going to partner with us. Jesus is looking for workers to send into the fields of this world to see a harvest come. A harvest of souls. He's looking for active workers to be in his field. Paul actually teaches us about this in Romans. In Romans chapter 10. Teaches us how people come to the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. He says this beginning in verse 8 of Romans 10. In fact, it says, the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart. Let me just pause there for a second. The message of the gospel is close at hand. God is looking to spread this gospel message to all who will hear it and respond to it. And how is it close at hand? It is on your lips. It's in your heart. Continue on. And that message is the very message about faith we preach. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you're not a believer in Jesus, if you don't consider yourself a Christian today, this is how you become a Christian, by openly declaring that Jesus is Lord and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. The Bible says, in that case, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. It is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scriptures say, as the Bible says, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. That's what Pastor Bruce and Lisa were telling us about today. If you trust in the Lord, if you're obedient to the things that his word says to us and what he prompts us to do, if you're obedient to that, you will never be disgraced. God won't allow that for his children. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. It doesn't matter if you were born into the people of Israel, God's original people, or if you are Gentiles like I presume most of us who came to God through the person of Jesus Christ. We're all the same. We have the same Lord, the one who generously gives to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the gospel message. This is the message that's supposed to be on our lips and in our hearts so that it can be close at hand to those whom God is seeing to bring in in the harvest that he is seeing fit to bring into his house, into the place where he is. It's that harvest of souls. Paul continues on to express the same desire that Jesus expressed in that teaching to the disciples about the harvest, where he continues on in verse 14 by saying, but how can they call on him? How can they call on Jesus to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will, and how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? This is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring the good news. 
Jesus is wanting us as his disciples, as Christians, as followers of him to be these people who are messengers of the good news, who have that good news not only in their hearts but on their lips so that it can be close at hand to those that God is putting in our path. Jesus continues on in this teaching in Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20, when he said this, just about ready to ascend to heaven. It says, then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but still some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, commands not just those who gathered in that day, but us as his followers in this day to go. He says, go and share this gospel message that all who call upon my name will be saved. All who believe that I am the Son of God and that I've been raised by my Heavenly Father on the third day, if they will believe that and confess it with their mouths, I will save them too. They too will be my disciples. They go from being a part of the harvest to being a part of the workers. Go, but you're not going by yourself. I'm going with you. And when Jesus goes with us, so does all the authority that was given to him. Authority that not only exists in heaven, but exists here upon the earth because we exist here upon the earth. And he lives in us. Go. Salvation has not been shared with us to make us a static people. We are to go. Salvation has come to us so that we can have beautiful feet. These messengers who use what God has given them to go into the places he is calling us to go because there's a people there. There's a people there that need to know this gospel message. There's a people there that need to be saved. This is the church's mission. One theologian once put it like this. The church exists by mission, just as fire exists by burning. Just think about that for a second. The church exists by mission, just as fire exists by burning. What's he saying? No burning, no fire. No mission, no church. This is why we are here. As much as church is meant to be a support to us, and it is a support to us, it's a support to me. I was at a, some of our church family had us over last night, myself and Jennifer, just to come over for a meal and just sit around the table. And of course, you talk about the things of God. Of course, you talk about scripture. Of course, these things just come up. And as much as they were asking us questions because they are fairly new to the faith, we left there just invigorated by their presence. Of course, it's a support to us. Of course, we need to come into a place like this and worship, which is one of the reasons why it's important for us to care for a place like this. This is God's house, and we need to treat his house with respect. But we're not just meant to stay in this place together. We're meant to go because there are others who need to know this gospel message. I'm going to ask Mark Miller to come up. I want him to give a little testimony of one who did go and brought the good news to others. Brother Mark. So some of you know my family's story. Back in 1975, way before I existed, 12 months, well, back in that day when Pastor Bruce was a teenager, my mom and dad were living in uh, Spryfield, Sprytown, and uh, my dad was a pretty successful businessman. And uh, he had the toys, had the travel trailer. He had a successful career and a side business. Uh, he owned a bar. 
but he was an alcoholic, and that's a deadly combination. If you're an alcoholic and you own a bar, that's not a good scene. Uh, My mom was pretty broken. My mom was actually just before the fall of 1975, uh, my older sister had experienced a uh, life and death moment, an allergy to shellfish that almost um, killed her. Her throat was closing over, and my mom and her brother were racing to a hospital in Newfoundland, and my mom cried out to a God that she didn't know existed and said, if you're real and if you save my little girl, I will find you. And she felt something in the car that night. She didn't know what it was. So that was in earlier in that year, in the fall of 1975. Um, she was searching again, and there was a guy. Uh, so at that time, my sister was about four or five. My brother was four or five months old. And again, I, I wasn't around yet. She was a broken lady, and she was struggling with depression, and she was um, so desperate she had become suicidal. And so she actually hatched a plan to take her life and take my brother and sister with her as little kids. So uh, suicide and, I guess, two homicides. Um, And so during that time in Spryfield, there was a guy that lived across the street, and he was not an evangelist. He wasn't a pastor. He wasn't anything, you know, uh, that we would think of in terms of an eloquent speaker. In fact, they said, I I remember my parents telling me that uh, that he actually couldn't speak very well. He had a bit of a stutter. And he was a a painter. That's what he did. His name was Carl. You've probably never heard of him, and you probably wouldn't hear of him unless I told you this story. Carl Stevens and his wife were good Christian people that lived in Spryfield. And uh, I actually asked my mom about this recently. She said he would frequently come over on Saturday afternoon and just sit and have a cup of tea around the table. And she said he would never preach to us. He'd never even talk about God, actually. He would just be there. And she said, I remembered he had this calming presence, just this. Obviously, we know as Christians we carry something, or we ought to. And this guy, Carl, did. And he would just frequently come down over his yard, over the neighbor's yard, and into my parents' yard and just sit and have a cup of tea week after week, just relationally. One uh, Saturday night, he he came down, or Saturday afternoon, as was his tradition, and he said, "Um, my wife and I go to church. Would your little girl like to come to Sunday school with us? And, of course, my mom leaned over or yelled out to my sister and said, do you want to go to church with the Stevens tomorrow? And she said, I'd love to. And so she did. She goes to church, experiences Sunday school, loves it, comes home, mommy, mommy, you got to come to church with me, you got to come to church with me. How many of you parents know that when your kids are persistent enough, you just say yes to whatever they're asking just to (laughs) shut them up? She said, fine, I'll go with you. Well, next Sunday rolls around. And next Sunday, how many of you know when you promise your kids something, they do not forget? Mommy, you promised. Mommy, you promised. Mommy, you promised. So my mom, and she told me this, she told Kelly and I this the other night, she said, I went to church that morning with my little mini skirt on. My mom was a bartender at my dad's bar, by the way. So my mom gets up and goes to church, and it wasn't a big church like this, didn't have all the fancy lights. It was just kind of a little country church, I guess you could say, back in the day. She said, Mark, when I walked into the building, I felt that same presence that I felt in the car in Newfoundland. And, and the pastor came out. She said he didn't even, I, I've never heard this part of it before. She said he came out and he didn't even preach. He just gave an altar call from the very start of the service. It says some of you need to meet Jesus today and, and, and find purpose to your life. And he gave an altar call. And my mom said she was just like ugly crying and made her way to the front, miniskirt and all. And she gave her life to Christ that day. And it transformed her life. The way she describes it to us is she said, you know, after a fresh rainfall, how the asphalt is darker, things seem brighter, the sky is bluer. She said, I just, it was life transforming. My dad was still obviously an alcoholic and didn't have the same experience. And so there was tension in their marriage up until this point. And she just continued loving him and just continued to grow in her faith. She told us, uh, the other night that some people had found out what, whatever they said, uh, whatever happened to Hilda Miller, and they were like, somebody said, she found God. She's like, what? So they came home from this trip, this other couple, and they said, uh, we want to go to church with you. Anyways, that's a different part of the story, but her, her and my dad, um, you know, they were struggling through. My mom had this new relationship with Jesus. She realized why uh, she was put on planet Earth to have a relationship with God, and um, 
several months later, getting towards Christmas, she actually was playing Christian music, and she would always shut it off before my dad got home because she didn't want to, you know, cause any conflict. And so my dad called her that night, and he said, I was at such and such a bar. I had a couple of beer, and they were disgusting. So I went to a different bar. This was back, I guess, when drunk driving was allowed. I don't know. Had a couple more beer. They tasted disgusting. I went to another buddy's bar, had a few more beer, and they tasted disgusting. I'm coming home. So he comes home, and he gets home earlier than she expected him, and the Christian music was still playing, and he said, what's up with you? So she was outed. He knew that something was different with his wife, and um, so she said, I, had a, I, I found God. I found Jesus. I was like, what does that mean? She was like, I don't really know, actually, but life is different. And anyways, that transformed, and my dad said, he, my, my dad, Pastor Bruce, you'll love this story. My dad actually went on a youth retreat. I was like, Dad, so you weren't a Christian and you went on this youth retreat? He was like, yep, as a leader. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> Somebody's getting fired. <laughs> so my dad's on this youth retreat and hearing about God and worshiping and seeing these people uh, experiencing and loving Jesus. And anyways, the Lord was nudging him and kind of pushing him, obviously. And anyways, my dad came to faith. And then, you know, a year later is, is when I was born and I grew up, uh, and the whole point I want to say is that I grew up in a totally different environment and home than I would have if Carl Stevens didn't cross the street. And he just made the invitation. And so I've started to do this. We, we switched our cable the other few months ago uh, from one company. To the, so the tech came to our house. I invited him to my church. I was like, dude, you want to come to church? <laughs> he hasn't come yet, but he's got my number. Um, I've got regular taxi drivers that take me to the airport because I travel a lot. I'm always inviting those guys to church. I'm going to keep inviting them. And so maybe we ought to be a little bit like Carl Stevens and just build some relationships and just invite people. Just get them to come because there is something about the presence of God when we gather in a place like this. It changed my family's trajectory, changed my life, my mom and dad. And, uh, yeah, so Carl Stevens, he knew what it meant to go. Let's thank Pastor Mark. From one man's obedience. Oh, boy. You probably won't find Carl Stevens' name written in any earthly book. But in heaven, his name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And sometimes I wonder if that book that is being cultivated even now, names are being written in it even now, if it's not laid out almost like a, like a family tree. Like from Carl, Hilda, and from Hilda, Gary, and from Hilda and Gary, their kids. Pastor Mark is Pastor Mark because he was obedient to the Lord to go to Bible school and serve him in Newfoundland and now works for Billy Graham uh, Association. Who knows how that family tree keeps going out and out and out. I'd love for that to be said of me. Even if it's unspoken. Even if just when we all get to heaven, as the song says, if it's unfolded for us just to say, this is what I did through your life just because you did go just because you did cross the street, just because you did invite, just because you did share your life with someone else and say, this is what Jesus has done for me and he can do it for you. I would hazard a guess there are now countless others. There is a pastor in this city who is ministering right now, Pastor Mark's brother, Pastor Mike at Nova Church. And what Carl Stevens did just keeps rippling out and out and out and spreading and spreading and spreading. Never underestimate or discount the impact one person can have on another. Never doubt what God can do through one man or woman. I'm going to share one more story from the Bible, and then we're going to close. In the Old Testament, several places, but in the book of Numbers, chapter 16, 
There was a moment when the children of Israel, there was more than one moment, but this particular moment when many within the children of Israel's camp as they were in the wilderness were rebelling against God, rebelling against Moses and Aaron. They were following this man named Korah, and they were wanting to, they were wanting to depart from the way that God had prescribed for them when it came to worship. And God was so angry in this moment that he said, I'm going to wipe these people out. I'm going to start over, Moses. I'll start over through you. Tired of this. But Moses had compassion on the people. He and his brother Aaron fell down before the Lord and begged the Lord not to do this. And as God's judgment started to go out amongst the people in the form of a plague and people started to die. Moses told Aaron to go and grab an incense burner. It's this gold stick that they had crafted and there was incense in it that would burn before God. He said, grab the incense burner and run out amongst the people. And as Moses did that in obedience, as he went... As he listened to the command to go, the Bible says that wherever Aaron went, the plague stopped, the death stopped. And in a portion of Scripture in Numbers chapter 16, verse 28, it says this, And Aaron stood between the dead and the living. And where he stood, the plague stopped, the death stopped. I think God is calling us all to go to a people who are dying And they don't even know it. Dying in their sin. Dying in their separation from God. Dying in deception that they now believe to be the truth simply because no one has ever told them the truth. No one has ever shown them the light. I don't hold it against them the same way I wouldn't hold it against a blind man for stepping on my foot But if we don't go to them, they don't even know that they are blind. They don't even know that they are living in darkness. But if we will go and we will bring this message, if we will hold that message high the same way Aaron held the incense burner high, I take God at his word that in that place, the death will stop. People will be saved. People will come to know the saving grace of our Heavenly Father. They will come to receive Jesus Christ and be forever changed. So who will go? Who is willing to run to a people who are dying and hold high this gospel message, telling all that he alone can save? Who will go and tell the people that Jesus died for their sins? Who will go and tell them that there is peace with God through Christ who will go and tell them that their sins will be washed away and that they will be made as white as snow. Who is willing to stand between the living and the dead? Who's going to cross their street? To a family that is obviously hurting and they don't even know how badly they're hurting. Who's simply going to make an offer? Hey, We have a kids program at my church. Do you think your kids would like to come some Sunday? Would you like to come with them? We're having a a thing at my church called Alpha. It's just this casual way to get together, share a meal, and talk about God, maybe ask some questions, watch a short video. It's not that much of time. I can pick you up. I can take you with me. Will you come with me on a Sunday? 9.30. Go a little early. Grab a cup of coffee. It's good people. You'll enjoy the songs. You'll enjoy the atmosphere. I love it. I think you'll love it too. Are you willing to go? Are you willing to stand? Are you willing for God to use you so that where you stand, the death can stop? Will you have compassion upon the people the way that Jesus had compassion? Will you have compassion upon the people the way that Moses and Aaron had compassion? 
You don't need to strive for it. You don't need to educate yourself before you go. You simply have to be willing to go, to say to God, send me. And as I go, I trust you to do what only you can do, for only God can save. For only God, through the Holy Spirit, can draw people unto himself, but they need to know the gospel message, and that gospel message is at hand. It's on your lips. It's in your heart. Let it out and see what God will do. As the worship team returns. And before I pray for us all, to receive an anointing from God to go, there are some people that hold a special calling to be an evangelist. Mark works for the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. If we could recognize anyone's calling and anointing as an evangelist, Billy Graham's on everyone's list. And I know sometimes in moments like this, there's been many a pastor say, who knows if the next person you meet is the next Billy Graham, and through your life, they come to faith, and they just go all over the earth preaching the gospel to see millions and millions and millions of people get saved. I think that would be awesome, but I think it'd be really cool, too, if you met a Carl Stevens. Someone told Carl. Someone reached out to Carl before he crossed that street. Someone invited him to church. Someone told him that Jesus saves. Someone told him that God doesn't show favoritism that anyone who will reach to him, he will reach back to and will pull out of that death, will pull them out of that sin. Someone told Carl, will you? If you're here today and you do not know Jesus, I'm going to beg you today in my own way to come to Christ. Whether you're here or you're watching at home, the Bible is true. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a promise of God, and God keeps his promises. Even if you don't know what it's all about, of course you don't. It's okay. I'm still learning myself. The conversation we had last night, so we're learning all the time. Every time I read the Bible, something new comes up, something new is sparked in me. Something changes on the inside of me. This is a forever journey until that day when we stand before heaven and all the mysteries of God are revealed to us. But in this moment, all you need to know is that there is a God and Jesus Christ is his son. If you will believe that in your heart and confess it with your mouth, asking him to forgive you of your sin, he will wash you as white as snow. The Bible says that he will take your sin from you and remove it from you as far as the east is from the west. He will take it so far away from you, it can't even be quantified. And not only does he cleanse you, but he comes to you and starts to share his life with you. You may have caught in little glimpses or samples of that life just as the Millers did when Carl Stevens would come over. Just as something's different about that person. Something's different about this place. Something is different when I'm in their home. It's a peace that can only come from God. It's a peace of mind and a peace of heart that comes from Jesus as he just causes you to be in relationship with him, as he shares his life with you, as you as he's just with you. Just like the Bible said that we read today, the portion of Scripture, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age, even when the end of all things comes about, I will be with you. I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. But it starts with your decision. It starts with you believing in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, believing that as you do, you are made right with God. Openly declaring your new found faith, knowing that in that moment, you are saved. So 
if that describes you in any way today without embarrassing anyone because that's not my goal nor my intention I'm going to just encourage you to stand to your feet just so I know who I'm praying with today if you want to be saved if you want to know for sure that you are made right with God just stand to your feet and let me pray a simple prayer with you everyone in this room who professes to be a Christian has come to a moment like this they've done the very same thing it's just a public declaration I'm only going to give it a moment and I don't want to miss anyone going to pray this prayer. I know Arlene is already a believer, but I'm going to pray this prayer believing that there's people at home. And honestly, I sometimes I pray this prayer every week because I want us as God's people to embrace this truth, not just for ourselves, but have it in our hearts and upon our lips for the time that God will use us to pray this prayer with someone. So with that in mind, if we could all just stand to our feet in this moment and pray this prayer together, believing that even at home, as someone is watching this with us today, is praying this prayer for the first time. Let's pray it together by saying this. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust you and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. If you have prayed that prayer for the first time, whether here or at home, we do want to connect with you. We would love to just make friends with you. This is a great church and we recommend that you go to and be a part of a great church, but there's great churches all over the city and you're not from this area, I promise you there is a church for you wherever you live. But now in this moment, just before we sing a song in closing, as believers in Jesus Christ, I'd like to pray a blessing over us, but I'd also like to ask God to anoint us afresh and anew to be about His mission for us to be on mission as his church just as a fire is not a fire unless something is burning we are not a church unless we are on mission and so in this way I'm asking our Heavenly Father to light us on fire for the sake of his kingdom to light us on fire so we can be about what our Savior and Lord commanded us to be about to go and to declare the good news of the gospel to all who will hear us. So with your hands lifted to heaven, I pray, Heavenly Father, I beseech you to pour out your spirit upon your people, to light a fire in them that will compel them to go, that will allow them to hear your voice in a way that they have perhaps never heard your voice, to feel your unction, Holy Spirit, to cross those streets, to speak to that person on the bus, to talk to that co-worker, to invite someone to Alpha, to invite someone to church, or just to simply say, listen, I have to tell you what Jesus has done for me. Put something on the inside of us that will no longer stay contained, will no longer stay inside. It has to come out for fear that we might burst. Put your message on our lips and in our hearts so that it is at hand for the harvest that you are seeking to bring into your storehouse. We believe for this in Jesus' name.